Hello, everybody, and welcome to Life Negotiations. My name is Lucine Meravi. I am a professional negotiator. And in these episodes, I bring you professional negotiators where we talk about everything that has to do with negotiations, be it hostage negotiation, diplomatic negotiations, corporate negotiations, everything negotiations we talk in this show. Now, today's guest is a very special one in the negotiation world. He is known as one of the legends. He has worked over 30 years in law enforcement. My next guest is the very first chief of the FBI Crisis Negotiation Unit. He was the leader of over 350 negotiators on the field. He has written a book, shared his story. He was part of many, many crisis negotiations all around the world. It's fascinating to learn from him. He is the author of Stalling for Time. Gary Nesner is my next guest. This book is a definite, I definitely recommend you to read this book if you want to learn more about crisis negotiations. This is something that not only is the storytelling fascinating, but also what he shares, you know, for taking many notes. So without further ado, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Gary Nesner. Gary, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to having this conversation with you today. Um, obviously, as a professional negotiator, I look at you as a kind of legend in the negotiation world. Like everybody knows who Gary is, but for those who don't, could you please give a short summary of who you are, what you do, and mainly what you've done? Well, it's a pleasure to be with you today and, and have this chat. Um, I spent 30 years in the FBI and over 20 of that as a hostage negotiator. And the last 10 years of my career, I was the chief of the FBI's crisis negotiation unit, the first one to hold that job. And in, in my position in the FBI, you know, I was responsible for 350 FBI negotiators spread around the country and uh, 10 full-time negotiators on my team. And we responded to hostage uh, situations, uh, kidnappings around the world. Um, I worked prison riots, hijackings, uh, right-wing militia standoffs, and, you know, assisted police in, in a, a wide number of more routine suicides and barricaded incidents. And my unit handled over 120 kidnapping cases of Americans overseas. So um, that experience led me to write my book, Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hosses Negotiator. And one of the big incidents, <laughs> thank you for the plug. One of the big incidents was the uh, 1993 Waco incident that uh, was subsequently made into a, a six-part uh, TV miniseries that, that, that I was involved in. And um, so now I, I, you know, long retired, I give corporate speeches and try to enjoy life, work on my golf game. Yeah, that, that, that's really so impressive and so amazing. And I can't even imagine the impact that you've had not only on the people that you've saved from these crisis situations, but their families. And besides the work that you've done, you've also spent a lot of your time and efforts in training others, right? In transmitting knowledge. Uh, you've written this book, which is um, obviously I recommend to everything, everyone to read this book, Stalling for Time. Um, and what I really loved about it was one of the first things that I read. I I'll read it if you allow me is simply in the introduction. So you haven't said anything yet, but you say, I know my own life relationships have benefited from what I've learned along the way as a hostage negotiator. And I believe these skills can help anyone to become a better person. So you're not saying negotiate, a better person, a more engaged spouse, a more attentive parent, a better friend, and a more effective leader. Before we can influence others, we must first listen and understand and listening is the cheapest concession we can ever make. I absolutely love this part because when I'm teaching people in how to negotiate better, I always tell them I'm not here to make you a better negotiator. I'm here to teach you the negotiation skills that will also make you a better person. And that is why I'm so passionate about, about the job that we do and about training others. And um, I was so happy when I read this, like, yeah, I so agree. So if I've read your book correctly and followed your work, obviously, and everything you're teaching, it seems to me like you built your sharing knowledge on four or five pillars. 
And correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a lot about how to establish trust and the importance of trust. Number two, the importance of self-control, how to know how to manage your emotions in difficult situations. And the third would be then very active listening to truly understand what's happening. And the notion of help me help you. Yeah, I think, I, I think all of those and, and some more, you know, uh, what I realized at the end of my career uh, was that the lessons we learned in, in the law enforcement context. Now, if that will keep someone from killing someone else in a very tense, highly emotionally charged situation, and it works with a very high percentage of success, then why wouldn't it work in less dangerous, more routine situations in life where, you know, taking the time uh, to listen and understand someone else, to demonstrate not in a phony way, but in a genuine way that I, I want to learn more. I want to understand more. People, people like to be understood. They, they like to talk about themselves and what their problems, issues, concerns, their passions are about. And if you provide them an opportunity to do so, um, it's a very, very powerful way to create a relationship. Mm -hmm. In my view, essentially all human interaction is about relationship, everything. Uh, I, would, I would challenge someone to say, oh, that's, that's not that important. It's everything. It's, it's everything in, in dealing with your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your friends, um, your workers, coworkers, uh, subordinates, uh, supervisors, everything. It's being able to communicate effectively and understand each other. Um, and, it, and it shows a, a genuineness. You, you know, uh, Lucen, the the, the, uh, the word I've really focused on the last 10 years is this really nebulous thing called likability. Um, it might be hard to define, but we all understand it. We can't say these are the facets of personality that make someone likable, but we know it when we see it. So why is someone likable? That's what you want to be. You want to be a likable person. That doesn't mean you're uh, agreeing, even though you feel passionately different, it just means that you're investing the time and energy to understand and to be respectful. It's a powerful, powerful tool. Absolutely. So with, with those skills and we add the likability part of it, do you think anyone can learn to be a good negotiator? Are these skills really transferable or does it also need something intrinsic to become, let, let's forget about the good negotiators. Let's go directly to the great negotiators. What does it take to be a great negotiator besides those skills that we can all learn if we want to? Is there something, you, you wrote that I had always been a kind of mediator and peacemaker among my friends. Uh, me as a child, I was pushed forward to negotiate with my father because my sisters didn't want to negotiate with him. So does it have something intrinsic that naturally you were already doing or can anyone become an excellent negotiator? What do you think? I used to have an argument with a psychologist friend of mine that um, over whether negotiation skills were nature or nurture. Mm. You know, was, was someone naturally good or did they have to learn these skills? And I, I think it's both. Yeah. Um, I, I, I certainly ended up being a far better communicator at the end of my career than at the beginning of my negotiation career. And um, I think everyone has uh, the ability to be better, but to be candid, there's some people for whom this is not going to be their path. Their personalities, their experiences are such that they're probably not gonna be the person that you would select in your business to, mm -hmm. to lead a very um, important negotiations. There are those people at the other end of the spectrum who seem to be naturally good. I always tell a story. We had a, a hostage negotiation class at the FBI Academy, and there was a brand new student from New York, an FBI agent, never, never had any prior negotiation training. So the first week he's at a role-playing exercise and I listen to him and I walk up to him. I said, you're the best negotiator I've ever heard in my life. I said, I, I've never seen anybody so incredibly talented at this. I said, I, I, I'm in awe. 
And, and that's how good he was with very little training at that point in time. But those people are very rare. The, the well, majority of made him extraordinary. His voice tone, his demeanor, his projection of sincerity and genuineness, mm -hmm. it, it just oozed out of him, out of his pores. And, um, you know, and I've known some other people like that, but I've never seen such a dramatic example of it as that. And, you know, for most of us, with training and focus and understanding of some of the psychological elements of this, we can really improve our game. But you touched on a really big uh, component. What makes a successful negotiator in law enforcement, and I think it's true all around, is self-control, flexibility, creativity, um, not being hung up on things have to be your way, uh, being open to new ideas and suggestions. And I think that comes through in a negotiation and helps you achieve your goals. Absolutely. And there's also this notion of conflict, right? Not to shy away from it, but see conflict as an opportunity to yeah, get more yeah. than what you had before the conflict. You, you know, it's so funny. Um, someone that gets into negotiations in, in, a, in a strange sort of way, and I don't think I've ever commented on this to anyone, uh, we're actually people looking for conflict. I mean, we, 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 we enjoy the opportunity to resolve it. Resolve, uh, exactly. It's the resolution it's a, of the conflict. It's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge. And you have to be fairly thick-skinned because, it, certainly in my former life, you know there is a certain percentage for which you will not be successful despite your efforts, your you know, your carefully laid out strategies and, and your sincere, genuine approaches, there are situations where people will lose their life through no fault of your own necessarily. So you have to go in, you know, it's a bit loose and it's a bit like a trauma surgeon. Um, you know, there's been some mass accident and in the emergency room, they start bringing patients in. Well, the surgeon has to kind of realize who can I save and who can't I save? And if they're operating and maybe it's a young child and that child dies, the surgeon doesn't have time to mourn that child and to allow it to influence his ability to continue to try to save other lives. Now, maybe he goes home or she goes home that night and feels absolutely devastated, but they don't have the luxury of that time. They have to move on. And I've been involved in hostage situations where someone has died already, and I've seen it greatly impact the thinking of police at the scene. And I said, we, we don't have time. We can't bring that person back. We can't. We, we've got to move on and realize that there's two or three other children in there we have to save. We have to focus all our energy and all our efforts on making this no worse than it already is. Yeah. So I, I think it's having that ability to think clearly. You know, I, I, I love the, each chapter of my book starts with a quote. And I, and I love the one from my, one of my favorite authors, Rudyard Kipling, you know, and it's, it's a partial quote that basically says, if you can keep your head about you when all else are losing theirs. Mm -hmm. And and that's, I, I've seen that um, where I've gone to a situation that's been going on for a few days and they'll say, oh, Gary's here. <sighs> what do we do? You know, and I don't let them get away with that. I said, tell me what you've done. Well, what do you think you might do differently? Yeah. What would happen if you did it? I ask a lot of questions to get them to where I think they need to go, but I don't want to start off saying, do this, do that, and boom, boom, boom. Mm. It doesn't teach them and it doesn't allow them to expand their thinking. So, you know, I, I ask those questions, you know, and next thing you know, they have an epiphany. Oh yeah, I guess we could try that again, you know, or whatever it might be. Absolutely, yeah. And I read something that you wrote uh, about leadership. I'll get back to that right after this question. But obviously when people think about you, people think about the, uh, Wacko incident, accident, how do you want to call it? Crisis, um, catastrophe. It's a historic event. Most of people know what happened. Many people lost their lives after you had been taken out of the negotiation team. So you went on and you saved many people's lives, including children. But unfortunately, the event ended in a bloodshed of the house burning down and then many people, including children, dying. And this had a profound impact on you. Now, without going too much into detail, now, looking back today, with the experience you have, the expertise, and, and obviously all the emotions having cooled down, 
How do you look back now? Is it still what you described exactly in this book or do you look at it differently today? Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote my book in 2010 and this event happened in 1993, the famous Waco event. So I had plenty of time to reflect before that longest chapter in my book was so in a nutshell, could you please say very quickly what happened and how do you know yeah, there was a, a religious sect um, uh, in in a cult you could say in in Texas and um, they had been scrutinized by the authorities for um, modifying weapons illegally making weapons automatic weapons which is against the law yeah. and selling them and that's part of how they made their money. There was also uh, child abuse allegations. Like so many other cults, everything surrounded a, a very uh, charismatic, narcissistic leader in David Koresh. Another federal agency, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, decided to uh, conduct a, a search warrant and arrest Koresh for these weapons violations. The Davidians found out they were coming and when the ATF arrived, there was a tremendous firefight and four ATF agents were killed, 17 wounded, and five or six Davidians were killed. Well, that started a big siege now, which the FBI came out to manage. And I led the negotiation team. And as you mentioned, I was there for the first half of the 51-day siege, and we got 35 people out, including 21 children. But it was a very expensive operation. There was a lot of criticism, what's taking so long. Um, it was a million dollars a day back in 1993. That's a lot of money. And um, FBI leadership at, on the scene became very impatient and wanted to take more external aggressive action to sort of force the Davidians out. As a negotiator, I know this is what we call the paradox of power. The harder you push, the more likely it is that you are to get resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I fought against that, but eventually I was uh, replaced with, with another negotiation team leader. They took a more aggressive approach and no one else came out for the remainder or the ordeal. The FBI ultimately armed with no other choice but to sit there forever or to try to compel them to come out, put tear gas in. And in response to that, the Davidians started the fires that ended up killing, I think, 77. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tragic event. And, and probably, I think most law enforcement negotiators would tell you, probably the most complex and um, difficult one anyone's faced. But People, at least in the United States, and I think certainly abroad, tend to overly simplify the complexity of it. And it's either these were very nice people, you should have been left them alone, big old bad government came in and decided they wanted to kill everybody. Or they're a bunch of kooks and nuts and they got what they deserve. Mm -hmm. So you get one extreme or another. And as we know, life is far more complicated, far more nuanced. I mean, you really have to pull back the layers of the onion to find out, like, there was a lot of stuff going on here. There was a, a, the FBI did a lot of good things, but our decision makers made a lot of bad decisions, you know, well-intended, trying to get the thing resolved, but decisions made without the proper training or knowledge, but nonetheless able to influence the outcome. And so it, it's, a, it's a difficult situation uh, in all respects. And looking back now, is it still what you described in the book? Uh, you, what I think was really courageous is that you also described, and, and, and I give you a lot of admiration for that, the difficulty that you went to personally. Because as I was reading the story from your point of view, I couldn't stop but thinking, how did this impact him? You can't come out of something like this unharmed, emotionally, yeah. mentally. And, and you described that. You said, I felt very sad. I wasn't sleeping well. Um, I became so withdrawn that my wife became concerned. And when people ask you what's happening, you didn't even know what to answer. And you said, I was low in energy and not feeling myself. And then you got the help that you needed. But you say, um, one of your colleagues in particular helped you recognize and address the anger over what happened at Waco and also your frustration over the failure of some FBI leaders to take responsibility for what had gone wrong. And then you have to live with that. You continue your career and you have to live with that. So how do you do that? And how can you, what advice would you give to people today who are going through hardship, 
who consider something a failure, whether done by them or to them or because of someone else. How do you go through that? How do you go through what I call negotiations with yourself? Well, what has guided me, and I think may have some applicability to your question, um, is something you may have heard of called the serenity prayer. Yeah. And I, I won't quote it directly, but it's basically, you know, to understand what you can change and what you can't. Yeah. And, and to be particularly attentive to the difference. And I think when I look back at Waco, uh, even though I did go through a very difficult time, as, as you mentioned, um, I, I knew that probably nothing I could have done would have changed because I, I think had I not made very strenuous efforts to steer it in a different direction, I probably would have felt guilty. But the fact that I did, mm. even though I failed, uh, provided some degree of comfort. Um, you know, one of the other things, in addition to talking to friends, is the FBI, while it defended itself publicly, internally it recognized that some bad decisions had been made. Mm. And so I was one of two people embarked with the task of training every FBI manager in the entire organization. If you have one of these crises, this is how you do it. This is how you make decisions. This is how you interface your negotiators with your other tactical teams. And helping bring about that institutional um, expanded knowledge about how to do this, I think gave me a, a, a real strong purpose that we can learn from this terrible, terrible human tragedy. Three years after Waco in 1996, also in the book, we confronted uh, another right-wing militia anti-government group called the Freeman in Montana. Yeah. And in this instance, the director of the FBI said to me, Gary, take your time, do this the right way. And it was a very dramatic validation that had we done things the right way in Waco, we might have had a very, or no question in my mind, we would have had a different outcome. Mm. In Montana, it took 80 something days, but no one was killed, no tragedy, no news headlines about big old bad FBI. Yeah. Um, and it validated this, this process. I have some concern in my advancing old age here that in some spheres of law enforcement, there has been sort of a return to a more militaristic model that I think we have to be very careful about and, and yeah. to make sure that when we look at these complex problems, that we don't allow our frustrations to guide our behavior. Um, you know, when you're emotionally charged, you know, the, the old teeter totter we, we always use when emotions are high, rational thinking and behavior is low. So if you can keep your emotions down, look what happens. Your ability to think and behave more rationally increases. And yeah. I don't think that can be argued against. No, and, that, so, and that starts by not shying away from those emotions, by recognizing them, by, yes. by mentioning them, and just let it out, and yeah. then you deal with it. And I think it's beautiful that you said that the FBI had the humility of saying, you know, we messed up on a few things and there are certain things that we should have done differently. And this is what we learned from it. And this is what we're going to do differently. And then go and spread that message to all future negotiators uh, yeah. to learn from what is that. What is kind of sad, though, is part of the conclusions or the lessons learned from Waco were really to do things after Waco the way we had done before Waco. In other words, Waco didn't happen because we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Waco happened, in my view, and some would disagree with me, but in my view, Waco happened because we departed from our very long-standing way of doing things. You know, the FBI, uh, New York City started the negotiations and law enforcement back in the 70s, but the FBI very quickly, uh, you know, embraced it and spread it throughout the United States and the world. And it, it saved thousands and thousands of lives. So we knew how to do these things. But it's funny, you've heard the saying about never being a prophet in your own nation, you know. Um, you know, so sometimes even in the FBI, because of our hierarchical structure, you know, every police department in the country might have listened to what we said, how to do something, but our own bosses didn't in this particular mm -hmm. instance. So it gets complicated, but, you know, it, it, there, there are always lessons learned and you have to look for those yeah, and improve. And um, what I found admirable is your leadership 
after that. And you describe that. And when I was reading that, I thought, wow, that is the type of leader that I want to work for. Um, you say, so the Waco incident, and, and when you saw from a distance what, what, what was happening there when you were already out, you said it was the saddest and most painful day of my career. That day and into the night, I called every individual on the negotiation team I could reach to assure them that what happened was not their fault and not their failure. I told them how proud of them I was and that their efforts had saved 35 people who otherwise would have perished. In fact, I'm as proud of the work of this team as I am of anything else in my entire career. Well, thank you for reading that because um, it was important for me to do that because I think, a, I think a good leader has to constantly think, even if something is impacting you personally, yeah. what about my team? How is this affecting my team? Because they're my team and um, I'm responsible for them and they need mm -hmm. to hear that. Um, you know, I used to have a, uh, when I would deploy people from my team overseas on a kidnapping, they would call in the middle of the night and say, uh, here's the situation we have. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. And it's a little controversial. And I would say, you do it. You have my authorization. If anybody ever questions it, if it goes bad, you put it on my shoulders. Yeah. And that gives people so much uh, freedom to, to make tough decisions. Because you know, there's some bosses will say, oh, I didn't know they were going to do that. And, you know, it's not my responsibility. I would say, I own it now. Mm -hmm. I own it. I'm, I've heard what you have to say. You have my authority to move forward. And if anybody ever questions it, give them my name and number and we'll go from there. Yeah. And that is so important, isn't it? And I teach that in the training that we provide that the very first negotiation that you have and be it in business negotiation or else is you with your manager or boss or, or, or leader in yeah. your case is saying, okay, this is what I have in mind. This is what I want to negotiate. Do I have your approval before you go on the negotiation table? Because that gives you all the authority that you need to decide on what it is that you're deciding on because you already got the approval. And then you don't have to say, oh, let me get back to you. Oh, give me, let me call my boss. Because if you keep calling your boss one, two, three, four times, then obviously you lose all credibility. And they're like, why right. am I negotiating with you if you can't decide anything? No, so that's how you become right. then a decision maker. Well, you're not the final decision maker, but then you are on your field. Um, yeah. And that is so you important. Know, near the end of my, well, I would say four or five, six years before I retired, I had a new boss mm -hmm. who was not familiar with me or particularly what I, I was doing. Maybe, maybe seven or eight years before I retired, actually. But anyway... Uh, when he first got to me, he started questioning everything I was doing, every trip I had planned, every budget expenditure. And I started to notice this. And I, I asked for a meeting with him. And I sat in his office. I said, I'm under the impression that you don't trust me or have confidence in me. He said, well, why do you say that? And I said, well, I'm not used to someone questioning everything I do here. So let me explain to you. When I say I think I need to go to this conference, I'm not doing it so I can have a vacation. I said, I'm doing it because I believe this conference is important. I need you to trust my judgment there and to have confidence that I'm doing this for the betterment of the program. And if you don't have my, that, if I don't have your confidence, this is going to be a very uncomfortable relationship for a long time. Oh. He completely changed. I oh, said, if you have a, I said, if something's questionable, I'll come into you and say, I don't really need to do this. It would be okay, but I don't think it's that critical. But if I come into you and say, I need to do something, then I really expect you to give it your full support unless there's some compelling reason not to. And it changed our relationship. And we had a fantastic relationship after that. Mm -hmm. You know, he, was, he came from a bureaucratic culture in the FBI headquarters where they questioned everything. And it was a sort of an ad adversarial thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I said, I'm, I don't, at this point in my life and my career, I'm not going to work that way. You know, I don't have your trust and send me away somewhere, but I, I need this. But it's good that you addressed it and it's good that he listened yeah. and he actually did something. Absolutely good. did. And he was, and he ended up being an excellent boss and very supportive. Well, that's amazing because I had a similar experience, but it didn't end up that well because mm. while I was having a very difficult negotiation in another country and I was going back and forth, 
Um, it was a business negotiation. And at the end, we found a deal, we found an agreement, and I did not bypass anybody or anything. It was perfect. I spent what I could spend and everything was perfect. But since that was a negotiation that was taking several months, in that period, my boss had left and replaced by someone else. And so when I came back with the contract saying, ta-da, we've negotiated this deal and it's the best we could get, he was like, no way, I can't sign off on that. That's not the way we do it here. And I was like, what are you talking about? This is the, you know, this, I already had, had the You had the rug pulled out from under you, yeah. Absolutely. And then what do you do? And then the, 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 the way he dealt with that was also catastrophic from a leadership point of view. So what actually ended up happening, Gary, is I left the company. I thought I can't go in on a negotiation table not knowing for sure that I will have the backing of my boss. So that's there's not going to happen. There's a lot of bosses. It's the old saying about, you know, the ship is sinking and someone's worried about where the deck chairs are on the deck. You know, it, some bosses come in, particularly when they first arrive, they have to mark their territory, for lack of a better word, you know, and put their imprint or stamp on things and, you know, take very visible ways to show that they're in charge. And, and that's a real leadership error, I think. I mean, the first thing you want to do is really get to know your people, their talents, their skills, their abilities, and even their weaknesses. But when you have a good, productive employee, you find a way to support and enhance and encourage and promote them. You don't yeah. you know, say, well, that was my idea and you know, I'm in charge. And uh, yeah, I, I just, you know, there's another example that comes into play. When we were at major sieges, we would tend to work in 12 hour shifts. And somebody once asked, well, how do, you, how do you get the people going off shift to relax and get the sleep they need? Because they might be scared that they've been trying to negotiate all day long and they're this close to success. The next team comes in and gets all the credit for the success. Mm. And I said, I found a way to solve that. I have the numbers, the cell numbers of, of every member of the team. And when they're back at the hotel, here's what I say to them. If this looks like it's going to end successfully during our shift, we will call every one of you up and have you come and join us and share this success. And you will do the same for us. So if it goes tragic, we all share that. If it's successful, we all share that. And it allowed people to go and get some much needed rest. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, because they knew they would get the credit anyway. Yeah. They would be there to support their 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 colleagues if it didn't go that well. I think that's amazing leadership. And, you know, negotiations is not easy. When you're sent on a negotiation table, there's so many things that you have to think about yeah. and, and your, your own self-control and your own emotions and your own everything that you bring to the table. Yeah. So the least is to be sure that your decisions will be backed by your managers. So I think yeah. that's, not, that's like a non-negotiable that has to be in place first. And that is why when I train and give these trainings, I say it's partly leadership as well because it goes hand in hand. You can be oh, a yes. negotiator in the world. If you don't have the backing at home, it's not going to work. And, you know, your company has a big success in negotiations. And part of that is some obscure analyst on your team has spent countless hours coming up with the data and the statistics you needed to make your offer, to close the deal, whatever it might be. Yeah. You've got to praise that person too. You know, may, maybe not publicly, but certainly internally. So I really want to recognize Lucen because we couldn't have made this deal happen without her diligent work. And, and I think leaders have to really take that responsibility. It can be intoxicating when somebody above you wants to put all the credit on you. But you have to turn around and say, no, my team, my team. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that teams listen to that as well. And, and they know that you're not going to steal credit for their collective success and hard work. Yeah, because in the end, the negotiation is always in a team, right? It, the, the Hollywood movie, oh, I think so. like there's this one man that does it all. You know, it's not yes. a woman, by the way. It's always yes. a man, one man alone. And he does it all and all the success and beautiful. But but in real life, in real negotiations, we're always a team. We hardly go in alone. Uh, there is a team. There is negotiator one. There is negotiator two. And sometimes we're several. And business negotiations, there is sometimes legal coming. And 
So it's always a team. And of course, it, it helps you to stay grounded and have the humility of saying every success is thanks to all of us and every mess up is also because yeah. of us. No, I think, that's, I think that's very true. And the other thing is, um, as you're preparing for your negotiation, you have to really create an atmosphere. A leader has to create an atmosphere that encourages people to present ideas, even if they're alternative strategies. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, we were at the famous Waco situation, you know, and I have some of the most experienced negotiators in the FBI on the team. And I was pretty senior at this point in time myself. We had also some young negotiators who were there only because they were geographically assigned close to Waco so they could drive in and be part of the team, do the situation boards, you know, probably not be on the phone, but be part of the team. And we had a, a discussion once about which way to go. And this one young negotiator, you know, I went around the room and said, does anybody have any ideas, any thoughts? And he said, well, what if we, what if we took a videotape of these kids that are being held, that have come out, and they're being held by the Child Protective Service? What if we took a videotape and sent that back in? Mm. And I looked at him and I said, I was just going to say that, you know, and of course laughing because I, I had, you know, nowhere near in my thinking, but everybody laughed. And I said, that is freaking brilliant, you know, and we did that and it had a profound effect. Yeah. And that lesson always taught me, here's this one quiet little, I think it was the first thing the guy said over in part of the team and, you know, meekly lifts his hand up. Well, yeah. And we thought about this and you go like, wow, <laughs> you know, wow. And um, you, you've got to try to find ways that encourage people to share some of those thoughts and ideas. Now, some of them are going to be, eh, okay, thanks, you know, whatever. I mean, you handle it better than I just did. But, but you know, yes, you, you have to try to find ways to encourage people to speak up and, and to grow and to contribute. Yeah, absolutely. So there's so much to be done to become better leaders and better negotiators. So if younger generation is, is watching this uh, video and they're like, I want to be a professional negotiator. You know, I get that question. And I'm like, it, it, for me, it was by coincidence. You know, I didn't plan yeah. for this. Uh, you, I read, you wanted to work for the FBI ever since you were a kid. Yeah. So what advice what? would you give to people thinking, I didn't even know being a negotiator is an actual job. And now that I know I want to become one, what would you advise? Yeah. Them? Well, in the law enforcement context, uh, I, I certainly wanted to be an FBI agent, but it had nothing to do with negotiations because it didn't exist then. You know, so I'm I'm a young agent, and negotiations are just emerging as a as a sort of a specialty discipline. And I heard a presentation about it, and it just immediately clicked with me as something that I thought matched my personality and my interests. I mean, using communication skills to resolve conflict, I think is I come from a, I think my father was like this as well. I think conflict is a tremendous waste of energy. I just, yeah. I, I don't like it. I think it's a waste of time. So when I heard about this new discipline, I, you know, I certainly maneuvered myself to get involved in it fairly early and, and with no idea of what, how it would dominate my career and my life later on. But on the business sector, I mean, obviously in law enforcement is an easier pathway. You, know, you join a police department or the FBI or whatever it is, and you say, I really want to be a negotiator. You can probably, with a demonstration of good work and skills and your leaders support you, you can probably eventually get some training as a negotiator and have an opportunity to, to uh, use those skills. On the business side of things, it's a little bit more challenging because there is no declared position, you know, people, lawyers negotiate, uh, you know, accountants negotiate, you know, CEOs negotiate, everybody. Yeah. Life I think is there should be, though. I think it would be wonderful if, if companies yeah. can afford it, could have one designated chief negotiation officer. Well, who would I, 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 negotiate, I, but then also train the others. I think that would be fantastic. Well, I have, I have a, a, a lady who I did an interview, a podcast with who, um, I, I won't name her here for privacy, but but uh, she works for a huge multinational uh, international company, and um, her job is the negotiation officer. So she trains everyone in the company to negotiate. And and I said, kudos to that company for 
you know, uh, creating a position and funding a position with the appreciation that these skills and this knowledge, you know, even if you're not sitting at a table with an adversary or a, a competitor or a potential uh, client, you know, they can be used in every facet of the company's uh, uh, work. I mean, I think every, every, every manager of people should get negotiation training. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So for every company leader who is watching this, get yourself yeah. a training negotiation officer, find yeah. somebody who already has the basic and the personality for it, and then Gary and I can come and train that person <laughs> to become the best. You know, uh, I was recently asked about this in another interview um, with, with law enforcement, and because there's a big conversation in America now about uh, reforming the police and, and yeah. trying to find better ways to de-escalate situations. And if you look at the average law enforcement officer's training in the use of firearms, it tends to be quite extensive because it's, it's a very important skill and knowing when to use your weapon and when not to is, is dictated by the law and, and people need a lot of training and they need a lot of proficiency, so they have to do it a lot. Yeah. But we do almost nothing with communication skills. Still. And, mm -hmm. and yet that may be a far more important element in the long run. I mean, I think everyone I know in law enforcement has had the experience of working with people who are uh, not particularly good at that. Doctors call it the bedside manner, but I don't know what we call it in law enforcement, but the ability to show up at a scene, calmly get compliance so we don't uh, escalate up into a, a more physical confrontation. There are officers that are far better at that than others who seem to repeatedly have these problem cases. And it boils down to the way they talk to people. They don't know how to communicate in the most effective manner. Mm -hmm. And training, I think, could go a long way to alleviate some of these problems. Absolutely. And the whole idea is if they're spending so much time, energy and effort in training them how to use their guns, the whole idea of negotiation is for them not to use that gun. So yeah, I, uh, I worked with the police department quite, quite a few years ago, a, a medium sized police department in the United States. And they decided to train every single officer negotiation skills. Wow. And they did. The next year, their tactical team callouts reduced by 75%. Wow, in one year only. One year. Because the officers now responding to a domestic argument, um, workplace argument, whatever it might be, now we're better equipped with the verbal skills to diffuse it instead of automatically getting into a, you know, everybody's going to jail, we're putting handcuffs on you, we're going to, you know, do all that sort of thing. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that's not necessary, you know, every, every once in a while. But I think we can greatly reduce those instances. And I think the same thing applies in, in work. I mean, how many supervisors would be able to communicate more effectively with a, with a subordinate? You know, if they just put their phone on hold, came out from their desk, sat down in the chair and listened. I found as a manager in the FBI, I didn't have to solve problems as much as I would have thought but I had to listen all the time. People don't expect you to change your mind or come to a different decision or do something they want you to do, but they really want you to listen to them, to understand, well, boss, when you did this, that really impacted me negatively. And you sent so-and-so on this trip and I wanted to go on that trip and it was my turn. And yet you sent somebody else, you know, and you may find as a leader, I messed up. You know, or you may have a very good and clear, compelling reason as to why you did that, which that person deserves to hear. So, you know, you've got to be attentive to those things and listen to that employee. And, and I mean, listening is 90 percent of the of of dealing with problems. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a superpower. It's completely it undervalued. Is. And with, it is. the second you start using it, you see the impact. It's absolutely amazing in every conversation, in every community, absolutely. every relationship. And, you know, when you were saying about investing in, in teaching those uh, officers in how to negotiate and how you can then prevent the tactical team from coming in. I mean, it made me think about it's the easy way to break a door and just go in and get 
get the person out, right? That is the easy way, but it, it takes work and effort and everything to work through it so that you don't have to come to that. And while you were talking about that, it made me think about marriage. It might have nothing to do with each other, but if you think about it, it's sometimes also the easy solution to get a divorce. You know, we can't communicate. You did this, I did that, you did this, but you did that. And then, bam, we go for a divorce and we break the marriage, just like we would break the door. Whereas it would take so much more energy and effort to say, you know what, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk through this and we're going to find solutions and we're going to work on this. And I think we'll come to an era where today it's already 50% of marriages yeah. and, and divorce, right? But you, <laughs> Mr. Nozner, have been married for 46 years. 46 years. That's yeah, but so- to 10 different women. No, I'm just saying <laughs> <that's> the same. <laughs> the same one. She's been very, uh, I, I think, um, FBI. I think one of, the great, one of the great mysteries in my life is, is why, why she has uh, hung around. Uh, I jokingly say, yeah, I've been married 46, but I was only home 20. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it, <laughs> takes, <laughs> it takes a lot of work. And, um, you know, I'm, sometimes I'm like the plumber whose plumbing doesn't work at home or the electrician whose electricity, you've heard the saying, you know, that you know, so, so sometimes I haven't been as attentive uh, as I would be with a complete stranger in a crisis. So I've, I've tried to be better in my semi-retirement years, but it's tough. It's always challenging. You have to be flexible and adaptable and, and, and take your, I try very hard now when my wife's telling me something and I'm pretty sure I know where the story's going, but I have to drop what I'm doing and really focus, you know? Yeah. I think that's amazing. Being married to the same wife for 46 years, working for the same employer for 30 years, I mean, the new generation is just not doing that. So I think that's something that we can learn. Well, it's a, it's a, diff- it's it's a different time. Yeah, it's a different time. For me, uh, my 30 years in the FBI, wasn't a, it wasn't a job. It was, a, it was you know, I, I hate to sound corny, but it was like a calling for me. You know, I wanted, I wanted to do something unique, special, something that made a difference, something that and you did. impacted on people's lives. I hope so. And not only the negotiations I'm talking about, but you spend also a lot of your time and energy on transmitting knowledge, right? The manuals that you've written, all the articles, all the training, all these uh, other negotiation negotiators. So you left a mark on the negotiation world. And then, as you know, one of the persons that you have trained and you became his mentor, he then became my mentor. So that's beautiful how that knowledge then circulates, circulates towards the, the next generations. Gary, I could talk to you for hours, but I'm respectful of your time. I, to, to, to end this, I just wanted to read, if you allow me again, the last part, which again, touched me a lot of your book. When you said, if I've gained any wisdom in my FBI career, it has come from recognizing the degree to which everyday life can mirror the dynamics of the destructive standoffs I faced in my FBI job. Each of us is called upon to negotiate stressful situations in business, social encounters, and family life, time and again. And it's we will all need to be good listeners and learn to demonstrate our empathy and understanding of the problem, need, and issues of others. Only then can we hope to influence their behavior in a positive way. You might even say that all of life is a negotiation. All of life is a negotiation. That's why I'm calling these conversations life negotiations, because whether we realize it or not, we all negotiate every single day. We are negotiators. We don't have to be professional negotiators to do this this properly and have an impact on everyday life. Thank you so I, I, much for this conversation, I Gary. As I said, right. I talk to you for hours and hours, and I have so many more questions, but maybe we can keep that for a future future conversation. Um, for people at home, if they want to learn more about you, obviously I advise everybody to learn it, to read this book, Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator. Um, how else can they reach you, Gary? Can they still reach you or are you like, I've done enough, leave me alone? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a website, you know, www.garynesner, you know, altogether.com. Oh, and that has my has podcast links and articles I've written and, um, you know, other things. And um, so if someone, uh, and they can contact me through that site. And uh, I try to respond to everybody. It's uh, my, my wife laughs at me. I, 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 you know, in fact, I have one uh, this afternoon. I have a high school class 
of young negotiators um, out West. And they've asked if I would talk to them for an hour. And I said, sure, why not? You know, I, it goes to what you said before. I, I feel at this age, it's important to give back. It's amazing. Yeah. So thank you so much for this conversation, Gary. Thank you so much for everything that you keep doing for the negotiation world. Um, say hi to Carol and, then, and the courage that she had to stay with you despite you not being home half of the time. Uh, thank you so much for everything. And I'm, I've learned so much from you and your work. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will write the name of your book and, and your website for people who want to reach out to you. And for the viewers, thank you so much for watching this episode. And I will come back soon with another fascinating professional negotiator. Until then, take care of yourself, each other, and goodbye.